Welcome back. Now, from ex accessing our mobile phones, using a vehicle navigating system to find our way, and discovering the latest life-saving robotic equipment, artificial intelligence has become an integral part of our world. In his latest book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to AI, Arthur Goldstuck offers an invaluable overview of the past, present and future of artificial intelligence. He gives readers a front row seat to witness the remarkable rise of AI across all sectors of business and society. Aimed at both beginners and those who consider themselves experienced or skilled at using AI, the book also provides unique perspectives on generative AI as well as practical advice for using it. Arthur Goldstock joins us now in studio to talk more about this book and the impact of artificial intelligence. Arthur Goldstock, a very good morning. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. Good morning, Simpiwe. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. Are we becoming more reliant on AI to function for, on our daily lives? That's a key question because most people don't realize just how reliant they are on AI. They don't realize the extent to which it's already built into their phones and that they're using it every day. So when you're using mapping, for example, that is pure AI at work when it tells you which, the, not just the shortest route, but one of the most, uh, the least traffic in it as well. Mm, mm. So that's just one very obvious example. But even predictive text, it yes. uses something called machine learning, which is a basic form of AI. Yeah. So when you're getting corrections in your WhatsApps or your emails and uh, it saves you from embarrassment, it's actually AI that's saving you. Right, right. So does one need formal training to understand what AI is and the impact thereof? Well, you just need to read this book <laughs> to understand <laughs> AI and its impact, generally speaking. If you yeah. want to work in AI, then uh, there's two routes to go. The one is formal training mm -hmm. and getting qualifications and certification. And there are many courses you can do in AI. Um, I've been speaking to people at Wits University and University of Johannesburg recently who are heavily uh, engaged in uh, teaching AI, running AI courses and the yeah. like. Vitz even has a professor of AI. So you can see it's already part of the academic environment. But you can also teach yourself informally, either through online courses like uh, using Udemy and those kinds of uh, platforms, or simply reading up on it and uh, asking AI itself. Go to ChatGPT or Google Bard or Microsoft Bing, or it's now called Copilot, Ask them, what's the best way to learn how to uh, do AI in my field? And you can specify what your field of interest is. Because right. every field of interest has a different way of using AI. Right, right. Now, Arthur, remember there was a time when uh, we used to associate AI with uh, UFOs, the unidentified flying objects and science fiction films. So how has the world moved from that? Well, the wonderful thing is how the world keeps catching up with science fiction. Yes. And in fact, that is my original uh, passion for uh, technology, was reading science fiction novels and wishing that there was a world in which all of these inventions mm. could be real. Mm. And AI was one of those all the years. But what people don't realize is AI has been with us since the 1950s. Yep. That's when Alan Turing first came up with the idea of thinking machines, or at least laid out how thinking machines would work. Yeah. And a few years later, the term artificial intelligence was coined for the first time. So we've had investment in AI going back to the 1950s. We've even had what they call AI winters, uh, periods where investment suddenly slumped and people thought that's the end of AI. But for the last uh, 10 to 15 years, it's just been upward with new inventions and uh, new yeah. possibilities emerging every single day. Yeah, I'm actually glad that earlier on you touched on, uh, you know, one facet of AI, which is ChatGPT, which has become a nightmare for academic writers. So uh, how much of a threat it is to creative writing? It's actually one of the greatest boons ever to creative writing because people who use it instead of being creative are going to be found out very fast. So it will actually sort out those who rely on artificial means uh, versus those who are truly creative. The boon for the true creatives is that it saves them a lot of the writer's block, the idea generation. Um, for example, you asked ChatGPT, give me three ideas for a story about, um, let's say, a man marooned on the moon. And there have been many novels written about that. And ask it to give you ideas that haven't been written before. And then you look at those and you think, well, will that make a story? So it's generating ideas for you. It's not doing the writing for you. 
there your creativity has to come into it. But on a, on a more practical level for anyone in the world who has to write reports or do research, it can short circuit or shortcut that research dramatically. It can cut down the time it takes to come up with basic facts. I just have to warn though that these are called language models. They can predict the words that should follow each other, but they're not fact models. They can't uh, fact check for you unless you ask them to double check the fact. Even then, you've got to go to the original sources every time. But it can encapsulate for you what uh, has to be in your research. So you can be sure that you're not uh, missing out or you're not um, avoiding a topic that is critical to what you're supposed to be writing about. Okay, granted, uh, convenience may be mm -hmm. uh, the cornerstone or a pro for yes. chat GPT, but uh, uh, the argument is the writers or creative writers do not push the envelope in terms of creativity or letting their own creativity juices flow. This is where I believe that AI will actually force them to be more creative because you've got to differentiate yourself from AI-produced content. So one of the things I did in the book, for example, I said to my publisher that people are going to ask, did AI write this book? And the only way to show without any argument that AI didn't produce it was to make it highly personal, to draw on my own experiences in exploring AI, in discovering AI. So your experiences and your personal insights are things that AI can't do. They can't be you. You can ask it to match your style of writing, but it can't read your mind. So the creative writer has to really push the envelope in order to differentiate themselves from AI. And they have to think, how do I convince my audience that this is me and not AI? And that means that you have to raise the bar on your creativity. Right, right. And quite interestingly, you dedicated a chapter in the book, My Doctor, the Machine, to how AI has transformed healthcare globally with technology taking a lead during COVID-19 pandemic. Just expand a little bit on this. So there were quite a few things that um, AI did during uh, COVID. And companies like Amazon Web Services and Oracle especially got very involved in healthcare research where they used AI to speed up the ability to analyze the um, uh, COVID-19 a virus to uh, look at solutions for, to come up with drugs. And just to give you a very uh, quick insight into where that has gone, um, the, the, the first antibiotics uh, created almost entirely by AI have just mm -hmm. been announced, uh, produced in a time that previously would have taken decades uh, to do. So those are some of the things AI can do purely in terms of diagnostics and creating new cures and the like. But when you think about what it can do already now in, for example, diagnosing patients who have cancer, for example, AI can look at x-rays and it can highlight things that the doctor or the, um, the, the uh, x-ray uh, specialist cannot actually uh, spot yeah. or they're not sure about it. And AI will direct them to where they should zoom in, so to speak. Yeah. So AI becomes the assistant to the doctor, the surgeon, uh, the specialist. Oh, right. And those who don't use it are in fact going to be at a disadvantage compared to those who are using it to help them become better doctors. So it doesn't replace the doctor. That's okay. the key thing. It makes them better doctors. Okay, so it's basically playing a complementary role to the exactly. profession. Okay. Exactly. And you also touch on how AI can be used to solve the planet's climate change challenges. So what kind of solutions has AI brought? Well, we've seen IBM especially coming up with uh, climate uh, change, um, not solutions, but ways of measuring mm -hmm. and addressing uh, climate change issues. So uh, their um, artificial intelligence uh, systems, for example, can help to analyze very quickly what is happening in a particular region climatically, what is causing it, and then if there are ways for humans to intervene in doing something about it. We just saw a report this week from the United States, for example, that a, a very small regulation on um, smog be or, or, or pollution being emitted from uh, factories in certain states, if they affect neighboring states, there's going to be penalties. That forced the factories to clamp down a little bit on their emissions, and it resulted in something like an 18% reduction in pollution in those okay. neighboring states. Okay. That AI can 
guide in terms of uh, leading regulators or lawmakers to um, applying specific regulations or rules where there is high pollution. And almost overnight in this particular case, you uh, can see it addressing the issue effectively. If you don't have the idiots who argue against uh, climate change and claim that it's a conspiracy, those people will actually undermine AI. Those who see AI as being only a tool of control are going to undermine its effectiveness in helping us address things like climate change. And the focus seemingly is largely on the positive spin-offs that artificial intelligence brings to business and to society and to our daily lives. But not much has been said with regards to what can be done to save jobs because we've seen a jobs bloodbath pre-COVID and mm. even in contemporary society. So what can be done to ensure that jobs are saved in as much as we incorporate AI into our lives to make our lives much better? So AI isn't here to save jobs, and I agree it will kill many jobs. However, we have to look at the history of industrial revolutions. The first industrial revolution killed off many of the jobs involved in physically spinning uh, fabrics and, and uh, yarn. It brought in the spinning jenny, which introduced the industrial revolution and killed off a few tens of thousands of jobs. But within a year, there were already hundreds of thousands of new jobs being created because yeah. the quality of product was improving, the cost was coming down and therefore the demand shot up and that resulted in a boom in employment in uh, fabric uh, production. And it's, that's almost a metaphor for what we see today. AI will kill off a lot of the jobs that are repetitive, that are very manual and can be replaced by a machine. But what it will do, it will create a new category and in fact, many new categories of jobs that will result in a boom in employment in IT. Cybersecurity, for example, is... But the concern is that uh, the new category of jobs, is it sufficient to replace the jobs that have been lost? I think in the long term, we look back and we'll realise that it created a new boom um, in employment, but it did kill off a lot of manual labour. So people who aren't trained, who don't have any qualifications and don't have the ability to qualify themselves further. They are in trouble and there has to be some kind of safety net for them, which we do in effect have. We do have social security um, in this country and many other countries. Yeah. And that unfortunately is going to be um, the, what, what people involved in manual labor will find themselves falling uh, back on. There will still be a lot of categories of manual labor, but anything that a machine can take over, it will. So we have to look at areas where we can add human creativity, ingenuity, and um, decision-making to the process. AI can make decisions, but uh, not as intuitively as humans can. Mm -hmm. And in as much as AI is useful, it's also become a danger to society because technology is now used for online scams, including technology trends such as deep fake that mimics individuals. I've also been a victim and um, I've seen my face and my voice being used uh, in this so-called Bitcoin or Forex scams mm, that have mm. been doing the rounds. And mm. uh, if I look closely, I never said those words, but AI made it, uh, made it look like I actually said those things that are said with all the lip movement mm. and body mm. movement and mm. everything else. And I also heard uh, a radio advert uh, that is completely generated by AI. Yeah. And that voice sounds just like you and me. So how does you, uh, AI make, uh, you know, or how is it a useful tool? AI is a tremendous threat to our privacy and to our security. But at the same time, it can be used to counter that threat. In fact, the tools that are available to address those threats from AI are uh, quite powerful. And it simply takes um, political will from governments and it takes the will of organizations to implement those solutions. People argue against regulating AI, but this is an area where there has to be regulation to make it explicitly illegal to produce that kind of material or to use it for commercial gain in any way. And I don't think anyone can argue against those kind of regulations. Since it is spreading like wildfire, do you think that regulation can help curb it? You have to have regulation. For example, if you look at financial scams, which are widespread, you have to have regulations to try and protect people. It still doesn't protect them completely, and that was long before AI. With AI, you need a new body of regulations to protect people from the specific threats that it brings up. But it still won't be the be-all and end-all. 
in the end, people have to be intelligent, they have to think critically about what they're looking at. And especially in the age of AI, we have to be careful as individuals that we're not fooled into believing everything we see online. Mm -hmm. So what's your practical advice to using AI? My advice is uh, very simple. Get to know how you're already using it. Um, get to know the tools that are out there. Get them on your phone. Try them out and see how they work in your everyday life. Ask it to improve your email for you. Ask it to uh, do a small piece of research for you. Ask it to tell you what the weather is going to be like in a mm -hmm. week's time. Just use it in your everyday life and gradually you'll become comfortable with it. So when it keeps advancing, you'll be able to keep up with it. All right, Arthur, great chatting to you. Thank you so much for attending. Thanks, Impiwe. Great stuff. That was Arthur Goldstock, the author of the book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to AI, talking to us about his book and the impact of artificial intelligence and how we can prepare for it.